phytoremediation, okay, so phytoremediation is the use of plants to pull pollutants out of water. So what do we do with phytoremediation? There are a bunch of different things you need to know about it. Most critically is that there are some general categories of it, and these are the broadly accepted categories of phytoremediation, how you use plants to pull pollution out of water. So we can go to the next slide. Um, the reason I'm going to talk about these three first is because these are the ones that are the easiest to do. And they're the easiest to do for this reason. We're going to see a project in a little bit that I've done where I use these. And these types of plants, the reason I use them specifically is because they don't have to be harvested because the pollution is not concentrated in the plant. In fact, the pollution is dealt with proactively. One of my most favorites is rhizodegradation. You all know about the oxygenated rhizosphere that's around roots and the rootlets. There's those little bubbles of air. Well, there are an amazing amount of biota that live in that environment specific to certain plants that will actually denature certain materials like toluene and petrochemicals before they ever get into the plant. So they've already been rendered harmless before they even get into the plant. And that way there's no accumulation in the plant. One of my big problems with the first three kinds of phytoremediation is that you have to do a lot of very active management. So if you're running a really seriously maintained site, one of the sites that I'm going to show you is one where we're going to invite a, re a local college to come over and do plant sampling and harvesting so they can start to manage those hyper accumulators because if they don't, I would never put those in a plan because if a bird lands on a hyper accumulator, it may leave with more pollution than an entire bird population could stand. But if it's on one of these three kinds of plants, one of these three different categories, the phytovolatilize, rhizodegrade, or phytodegrade, those plants are the same benign plants to the animals that whether they were in a polluted environment or not, but they're removing those pollution. So they're my favorite three and I use those. There are a lot of different plants that fit in those categories. If you look at the plant lists that are available from, I think Minnesota has a pretty good one going to their DOT and their D DNR rather. They have some, a pretty good list of plant species. If you look at the database that, um, you, that Oregon has, a lot of different, Oregon, like city of Portland has a really great database. What you have to do is start to interpolate some of the plant materials because there is not a real exhaustive database yet. So if anybody wants to go back to graduate school and get a great degree that will take them straight through to a stellar PhD, start to research different plants in the Midwest that work for phytoremediation because you could make some big money and save the planet, perhaps all of us. No kidding. Save the planet. That's good stuff. We need that, you know? So these are the three that I use most. And again, they do things outside of the environment of the plant or within the plant that degrade the pollution and return oxygen and water as the byproducts. And those are the easiest to use. So we'll go to the next slide. These are the three that take more management. So the most of those, uh, phytosequestration and phytoaccumulation, those both have the opportunity for those plants to become toxic. So you have to manage those plants. Those are the ones they typically use at uh, active sewer plants as part of that treatment train to get some of the heavy metals out of the pollution out of the water. Um, in rhizofiltration, the only reason I'm not wild about that is because now the roots are holding the pollution in situ and now if you have different species that eat those roots like you know ge uh, geese or fish, pardon me, you can have problems with the, uh, uh, the population. So I don't, I don't use those unless it's a very managed condition. Yes? Do you find that these three uh, actually extract more they can. That's a really great question. The question was, do these three that are more management centric, do they actually hold more pollutants or pull more out? And they can be very effective in that. Yes, they can. So one of the, one of the projects I'm going to show you in a little bit is a phytoremediation project where we're using floating islands. And the original floating islands have the first three kinds of plants in them so that no management's necessary. It's just improving the environment. But as we get this more developed, the next series of, of islands will have to be mowed and maintained and taken care of, but those, those will, be, will monitor how much is coming out of that specific water source. So yeah, it's a great question. But any of them are better than nothing is the thing. Even if we can do one rhizodegradator in a group, and there's no reason why we can't mix these plants into our plant pallets. In fact, they're probably already there. Maybe hitting, hiding in plain sight, you're not, you're, you're not a phytoremediator by nature, but you are. You just didn't realize it. it's there. But it's just a matter of mixing those in, like, like permaculture. You know, we just mix in a couple edible plants. We can do the same thing with phytoremediating plants, especially if they're part of our treatment train for the pollution in water that's moving through our sites. Okay, so we can go to the next. 
Uh, see, oh, this is terrible. Didn't copy worth at all. So these are some of the floating islands. So we can go to the next slide. Um, basically small. They're about 12 feet around. Um, mixed with a variety of species. We can go to the next one. Irregular. This is one of the graphics I did to sell the idea to the client of what fire remediation is. And in this case, um, I think one of the reasons I like this slide so much is it illustrates how much plant material is below the surface. You know, all the great roots. I, I'm fascinated by different quotes, and this one I found was really cool. If you plow or, or disc an acre of Wisconsin soil eight inches deep, you have more surface area than the entire state of Florida. Is that cool? So when you start talking about these plants, they may have a couple hundred square feet of aerial plant material, but the roots are sometimes 10 or 12 times that in, in coverage. So there's all that exposed area that's pulling out pollution that's in that environment anyway. It's just growing, it's helping the plant grow. But the other thing about that is if you think about a lake, and this is on a little pond, there's no shade in the center of the lake. It's pretty dry and hot, or what, wet and hot. Well, little fish fry are really at margin. They stay at the margins of the lake. So now what's happening is these are becoming incubator di districts for the little fish that can now go in and hide among those roots. And it also is shade for even the bigger fish below it. So it becomes a cooled area in this little pond and it's a win-win-win. So uh, these are just images from the same project, so we can go. This is the project, it's called Congdon Gardens. If you ever get to a place called Delavan, Wisconsin, off of 43, stop at the Taco Bell, look across the road across, and that's the ditch that goes into this. And there's this basin, and I, I won an, an art competition for this part a few years ago to do a sculpture garden on the, the face that, of that, that kind of faces the, the highway and, and Taco Bell. And uh, while I was doing that, I said, do you guys have a plan for your garden, for this part of the garden? And they said, no. And I said, well, I can do that. So I did the plan for this top of the garden. Then I was working, I said, do you guys have a master plan for your public garden? They said, no. Said, so in our art competitions, they're very beneficial. It's a good thing, who knew? So the next thing you know, I'm doing the master plan for this thing, and I discovered where this pond came from. This pond is actually the borrow pit that the city, the highway department used to build the overpass right over here. And when they were done, they wanted to, the DOT wanted to fill it back in, and the city said, oh no, leave it, we'll just create a little basin there. And so what happens is there was a, a shop co across the road over here where the Taco Bell is. There was a, it used to be a Kmart over here, but now it's a farming fleet. And then there's a freeway, and then on the other side of the freeway is a Walmart as part of a bigger shopping center. All three of those parking lots have subsurface pipes that come over and drop into this basin. So the only water in this basin is parking lot runoff. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Remember that part I said before about everything going somewhere? This thing is filled with petrochemicals, heavy metals, all kinds of stuff that you don't want anything to do about. And the DNR stocks fish in here so that people come fish who are desperate for protein. So the next, I mean, Delavan is a depressed city. So there are people who depend on catching fish in this pond to live. But if, if Homer Simpson's three-eyed fish lives anywhere in the world, <laughs> one that goes glug, it's here, right? This is terrifying. So as soon as I found that out, you can imagine how I freaked. I was like, oh my gosh. So we gotta do something about it. So anyway, the whole landscape is all my design and it's dealing with staging water and sediment as it comes in from the surface. But the big problem are these pipes that come in at three different points. And so I started to create these floating islands with the idea of eventually putting more of those in there. Because I told them, you can't print these signs in enough languages to say, do not fish in this lake. They're gonna be fishing and there's bad fish. Yeah. So have you measured the effectiveness of these islands We've had now, our, our, we only have one island in at this point and it just got floated. So we're, we haven't had a chance yet, but we, we do have that. There's a water testing uh, group called the Lake Geneva Conservancy on Geneva Lake. And he teaches now at George Williams College, which is a branch of Aurora University. And so I'm in, I'm, work, I'm in cahoots to bring him into this to do water sampling. And then I want to have his students, when we put in the hyperaccumulators, do the studies. So I've, I'm, I'm nefarious, I'm working on all this stuff. So we're, we're gonna eventually populate with this, we just have one island at this point. But that is a hope of starting to get some of that pollution out of that suspension, so we can go to the next. Uh, this is a, kind of a close-up, you can see some of those scary little pipes coming in. And this is the one from the old Walmart. Uh, this is a floating island. This is not the floating island that we installed, but it's the same uh, basic strata. 
Now, this is where the story gets kind of sad. It's one of those wah, wah moments. Um, when we were ready to float the island, I had specified all these great plant materials, and of course I showed up. You know, I had to be there with all the volunteers that are planting this thing. And at the 11th hour, the client decided to value engineer. Well, luckily, we kept the same fighter remediating spaces in. So that was good. No hyperaccumulators. None of that stuff worked its way in this project. But what did happen was I had a, a, a switch grass around the edges in a plant mat. I don't know if you guys use Agricol. I use them occasionally. They have a, basically you roll it out like sod, but it's a natural plant material or you can have them custom grown. Well, I had this sod grown of this switch grass because it's rough. You know switch grass, right? It's, it's got a roughness to it, the teeth, the, the, the straw, the, the function of it is, it's a great sediment harvester. In fact, if you're doing a series of islands or bands in the landscape, it'll pull sediment out to the fact that it'll actually kill itself because it's so effective at filling its own root zone with sediment. But in this island, I had it done there so that the urban geese would not crawl up there and eat all the plants. Well, that's the one that got value engineered. So unfortunately, the plants got really diminished by some geese. They went in there and hummocked out because they had no, no obstruction. They could just waddle on top of it. So unfortunately, ours doesn't look like that yet. But I did get enough people freaked out enough about it that we're going to get the switchgrass in and we'll have a better island soon. Okay, so this is a project I did with a level spreader. This is a classic wall on a client's property. This slope goes up. This is about medial to the watershed. But they had set serious foundation issues with this ancient wall. This wall is about 130 years old and it's starting to fail. It was a bullpen on the other side of it and their house is on the other side of that. So I created a level spreader, which is basically a, a big dig in the earth, lined with filter fabric and filled with differentially sized stone. The bottom of this is, it's about actually six feet deep. And the bottom stone is 18 inch boulders. And then it's surrounded with typar. Again, I have no, no stock in typar, but if I had any sense, I would because I spec the heck out of this stuff. And I teach our students about typar because it's the only filter fabric that you can get that's differentially permeable. And it's also a non-woven geotextile. I should probably talk about that for a minute. You know, I used to use um, tensor, I, I've used all kinds of different ones. Mirify was one I used a lot. And it's a woven fabric. Well, here's the problem when you're doing this as part of a water uh, separator. What the, the idea is, is this fabric is now going to separate all the fines in the soil from the voids between the stones that we're storing water in, right? So that's our money shot, is keeping those stones not ever filled in with different materials. It's one size stone. Then we put a filter fabric around these are filter fabric that keeps the dirt from coming in. Then the filter fabric between the elements keeps the fines from filling in the pores in the large, right? So we can keep those pores separate by putting this fabric in. And Typar, being a non-woven, it's very, very strong. But where I used to use the woven fabrics, you, when you have woven fabrics, and I don't remember which it is, but one is the waft and the other is the weave, if you have those come together and you put a stone in the middle, it'll force its way through <coughs> that weave. And so that's the reason for a non-woven geotextile. So basically this goes six feet deep. It's differentially sized stone all the way up to this three inch rubble on top. There is a tie bar four inches below that top of that stone. So at the bottom of that, that's a very shallow course because that's where the sediment is going to come out. Now I have some vegetated species that we're putting upstream from that they are going to diminish the, vet, the, the sedimentation. But if we ever have a cataclysmic problem or after this is all established, we're going to go back in, we'll actually pull all that out. We'll go down to that fabric and we'll remove the sediment that's accumulated then reapply the stone. And the Germans have been doing this so long, they call that material, they have a name for that material. And I, I shudder to say it because I don't know if German, it may be a very bad word. It's called, does anybody here speak German? Okay, it's called Schmutzedecke. It's what they call the stuff that gets through. And they've even got the, the technique of putting that first fabric very shallow so that you can just simply remove the capturing element, shake it out, and put it back in place and put the clean stone back in place. So that's what this is. This is a level spreader. And actually in that, toward the bottom, there are a series of uh, six inch perforated PVC pipes that I then direct to several different of the gardens to harvest that water. So this becomes active. It takes the pressure off of the foundation of that wall and as soon as we got that in, we had some torrential rains and the wall remained dry at the base. So we had no more failure of the old uh, stucco. 